Romans chapter 14. This is, um, what shall I call this? A peanut butter and jelly sermon. By that I mean it's just, you know, not steak, not dessert, just kind of a simple one. It relates to the, the freedom of, uh, that we're celebrating. Oh, by the way, there was this, this woman. And she came home from church and discovered that someone was in her house. She could hear them rattling around upstairs. And so she, she said, what'll I do, what'll I do? I, you know, I'm afraid to move. I know, I will quote a verse of scripture. And he says, well, what do I know? And she says, and she yelled at the top of her lungs, Acts uh, 2.38. And then she began to quote the scripture, you know, repent and be baptized. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promises to you and to your children and those who are far off. And then she grabbed the phone and she called the police, 911, and the police came, arrested the guy, and one of the detectives was asking her, now how come, how come you didn't run when you heard her come? She says, well, you know what, what that, that lady said? She said she had an ax and two thirty eights. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Romans chapter 14, verse 5. One person considers one day more sacred than the other. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. And whoever eats meat does so to the Lord. For, for they both give thanks to God, and whoever abstains does it to the Lord and gives thanks to God also. For none of us lives to ourselves alone, and none of us dies to ourselves alone. If we live, or if we, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because everyone who serves Christ is in this way pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us not therefore let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace, to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Oops, where's Sasha? <laughs> I had a sermon up, I'm sorry. It's the same one from last week. What? All right, that's all right. What, what is, is I'll just preach. That's okay, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, okay? okay. <laughs> now, if I was a teacher, I would have eyes in the back of my head and I could see what was not going on. <laughs> but when we read the Declaration of Independence, we see certain principles these truths are self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In Romans 14 here, it has a similar statement. It says, for the kingdom of God it's not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, 
and joy in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people get all excited about their freedoms. Now, as in Texas, I see people carrying sidearms around all the time. Some of them do not look like they are all there together, and I make sure that I keep my, my distance from them. Uh, if they had a, a mental health test, I'm not sure they would pass it. <laughs> and so uh, it's, it's different, but they take their right to, uh, what is it? Bear arms. Yeah, let's see, how does that go? Bear arms like that, you know? Rather than covered arms, they take their, their right to bear arms really seriously. That's one of their, their freedoms that they consider to be theirs. And various people have various freedoms that they get all excited about that they're willing to die for. Here in Romans, it says some of the principles for which the kingdom of God is most important here is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And that when we get all excited about our national rights, we need to temper that with what God wants to accomplish within our church and in our lives. Now let's talk about some of our national freedoms. One is a freedom of religion, that is, Government doesn't tell you how to worship. Uh, there's certain there are restrictions. You can't, you know, sacrifice children, and and uh, you got to be careful where you do some of your other stuff that you do. But uh, we have sanctuaries where we have places of free speech, where we can preach the word of God, even though it goes against some of the national values. It's a, a place of freedom of speech. And, you know, the notion on freedom of speech is people can say the, the stupidest things and they have a right to say it. They can say things that you know in your heart are untrue. And we would rather have free speech than censors telling everybody what they can say and can't say publicly and privately. You know, they're are certain places that uh, if you say the wrong things, you get 10 years in prison. If you're in Russia today, and even in your own home, you say that the war in Ukraine is, you know, a Russian aggression, you can get 10 years in their jails. And every now and then they take special measures to make things difficult for you. For example, if, if they wanted to make things difficult for you, they'd put you on a suicide watch, wake you up every two hours, make you stand at attention for five minutes while I search the whole room for stuff that you might be doing yourself in with. Well, that, the purpose of that is sleep deprivation. But, Free speech, we, we, we love that. But as Christians, that's to be also tempered with some things too. So we have freedom of press. People can put out on the internet the craziest things. And we have people that are following this and parroting it. And they have, you know, Facebook and other um, uh, social media. And they forward it all to all their friends. And we have freedom of press where people can say the craziest things, untrue things, uh, all kinds of things like that. But that's a freedom because you don't want people that are just censoring everything that you say and do to the way they want. You know, you don't want it like in Russia, where if you say something against the government, you go away for 10 years. 
or in certain places in Afghanistan where you go away forever because you declared something that the Taliban didn't think was right. In Romans chapter 14, it starts out by saying one person considers one day more sacred than another and, consider, and another one considers everything alike. In the Roman church, there was some discussion going on and it got very heated. There were the Jews that said, you need to take the Sabbath and dedicate it to the Lord. Of course, in Rome, they were a bit liberal as Jews. But they would shut down their shops on the Sabbath. Now, this is kind of funny. If you were lived in the country, or if you lived in the city in Rome, or in the Roman Empire, or in one of the Greek cities, you didn't have a seven-day week. For the common person, it was an eight-day week. Now, they had different calendars and different holidays and this and that, but you knew one thing. Every eighth day was market day. That's when you stopped working, you got up real early in the morning, you brought all your stuff that you'd been making and you had been uh, uh, growing. growing and things like that, things. And you would bring it into town, you'd see all your friends and you'd sell and you would haggle and you would argue every eighth day. And, but for the Jews, their holy day was every seventh day. And when market day fell on the Sabbath, that was real difficult. They'd have to get a Gentile to open the shop. And they'd miss all the fun. Although some were liberal and they said, well, you know, I'll, I'll make up for it. <laughs> and so there was an argument in the Roman church. You know, within our church, we could have lots of arguments. We could have arguments about politics and how one person sees this and how another person sees that, but we have worked hard to keep politics out of the sanctuary. Uh, and even though some people are very passionate that this is the Christian stance on this or that, we say, Let's, let's keep that out of here so that we can maintain some of the other principles that we see here in Romans. We have some people that are very passionate about their sports teams. You know? And uh, we, is, we kind of lightheartedly keep, allow a little of that here in, the, in the, the church. I mean, we even allow people to wear Rams hats. Uh, that's a, uh, an American football team, I think. It's somewhere here in Los Angeles. And, uh, but it's not disruptive. But if it became disruptive, where, you know, people were shouting across the aisles at one another, which one was the better team, then we'd have to keep some of the sports teams out. Um, there are other things that people get really passionate about. I, I, of late, I, I've seen people get really passionate about vaccinations, about opinions about COVID and how you treat it, and about various diseases and things like that. And people get really passionate about things, especially things they read on the internet. We try to keep that, uh, Pastor Matthew was saying, hey, you know, the church is divided on this, you know. I said, huh? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I've been away in Texas. They're not divided at all there. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> and so I had to say, I kind of tone down some of the, the comments that I was making. But here in Romans chapter 14, he says, uh, 
We don't live to ourselves. We live unto the Lord. He is the person that we want to please. And he's trying to do a work here in the church. He's trying to build a forever family and a, and a culture of acceptance. And if we don't have to argue about it, let's not. Instead, let's uh, uh, put ourselves towards the things of the Lord. Um, there's several principles here that we want to look at. In verse 5, it says, Let each person be fully convinced in their own mind. Develop your own convictions based on the Bible. Most people develop their own convictions based on just how they feel about things, Internet. how their parents, what they, uh, you know, what they saw on the internet <laughs> or social media. They, they, they develop convictions and passionate convictions and they stand up and they talk to strangers about it. <laughs> Loudly. The first one principle is that we need to be fully convinced in our own mind and develop convictions based on the Bible. Did you know some people out there don't know the difference between right and wrong? And they need to open the Bible and see what the Bible says is right and what the Bible says is wrong not just kind of following what their friends do or what they want to do or what they're feeling like. I'm going to omit one illustration about what the Greeks and landed Romans thought about their servants' children. But... Uh, that was something that they had to really work on with the new Christian church. Is they had to show them what was right and wrong based on the Bible. And so, let everyone, the first principle is let everyone be fully convinced in their own mind. And that takes a lot of work. It's much easier just to let the preacher think for you. Or let some talk show host think for you or let your mother think for you or let someone else but we have a duty to be fully convinced in our own mind develop convictions based on the Bible and so uh, I remember when I was in uh, uh, seminary long time ago in the 60s and then early 70s, I had to go through the Bible and figure out what my, what the Bible said about abortion. And I came up with some conclusions. And I was fully convinced in my own mind. None of those things I still carry over for today. But oftentimes today... We don't look at what the Bible says. We look at a verse here and a verse there. We take what a preacher says and we have our own convictions based on that. We need to look at murder. What is murder? Be thoroughly convinced in our own mind. We, I had to work through that when I was in seminary too. We were, we had to even do some of the original languages in he Hebrew and what what it meant to murder someone and what it meant to kill someone in battle and what was different and how they, how they did that. Developing your own convictions based on the Bible. Developing your own convictions maybe that relates to um, how men and women treat one another. What does the Bible say? And Christianity was revolutionary. Where in Christ there is neither male nor female, but all are one in Christ. 
And that really flew into the culture of everything, flew in the culture of the Greeks, flew in the culture of the Romans, flew into the culture of the Jews. But we need to develop our own convictions based on the Bible. Let me go on to principle number two. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the boss. And sometimes we want to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Lord, how can I please you? What is good? What are you trying to get done here? Principle number three is in verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So instead of defending your own rights, you're trying to do the right thing you're trying to promote peace among the congregation and for people to have the joy of the Lord. And if you get into too much of a conversation going on, it might destroy the peace of the congregation. But I'm right, Pastor, and they are as wrong as can be. And I'm going to straighten them out. I know a lot of people who have thought that way. Later on in the book of Romans, it talks about you having a freedom of speech and it, it, that you need to have friends that you talk to in your home about some of these, we'll call them disputable matters. Did you know you can't argue with, with a fool and you can't argue? You have to argue with someone who's a friend and they may be on the opposite side or have some other crazy view but you know that when you finish, you're going to leave it there and you're going to respect one another and still be friends. And that was one of the principles in the latter part of Romans 14 on how to handle freedom is that if you're very passionate about something, find a friend that can stand you and talk to them about it. And that helps straighten things out. By the way, I had a, a, an, a, an opinion that if you can get people into the Bible and get them thinking, in due time, the Holy Spirit and the Bible will straighten them out. Maybe even straighten you out. <laughs> And so those are principles of how to handle freedom within the church. As I said, there was disputable issues in the Roman church. One had to do with eating meat. Some of it had to do with the best and cheapest meat came from the meat market right by the pagan temples. Because people would bring their livestock in live. They would take and sacrifice this unto their God. And then they would take the meat after the person left and take it down to the butcher shop. And that's where they would, you would buy it. About half price. So people loved that. The pagan temples loved the income. And people like the good prices, but that bothered a number of Christians. Look, that, that, that meat there, that has bad karma. It, it, it's been sacrificed to an idol. And that bothered people to no end. So that was a big issue. That's not a big issue to us, you know? Most of us don't have to go to the kosher butcher shop. You know, we used to have a kosher butcher shop right over here on Hawthorne Boulevard uh, and 166. It was uh, Muslim kosher, but it was kosher. We didn't, that's not an issue to us, but it was an issue for them. They had an issue as, what was the holy day? 
Was the holy day going to be Sunday, with, which was the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Was the holy day going to be the Sabbath, which is a Saturday? Or all days unto the same? No. Part of the problem in the Roman church was they had slaves and they had no days off. And so their day to worship was Sunday night. And again, as I say, in, in the Roman household where they served, for most people, the big deal was an eight day week. And so they had to kind of keep track of when the seventh was and so on. So there was this controversy when and so the way the Roman church handled it is, well, uh, if you were Jewish, we'll go to church both days. We'll go to uh, the synagogue on Saturday and we'll evangelize and we'll take in the Old Testament and uh, we'll read Christ into the prophecies. And then on Sunday night, we'll meet with our, uh, the rest of our brothers who are slaves and things like that. And we'll sing Christian songs. So they just said, we'll just do it twice. That was their solution. But there became an argument in that as to which the holy day was. And the Apostle Paul said, that doesn't make for peace. Let's get together and let's praise the Lord and let's build one another up in love. Uh, there was also an argument over to what was clean and unclean out of you know, Le Leviticus. And, you know, like for example, if, if you were working in a certain industry and you touched something that was dead, you weren't supposed to see anybody for a week. And uh, the Jews said, uh, all right. But most of them said, well, we've got this kosher way of washing our hands, calling washing to the elbow, and we'll wash this way, have everything drained like that, and we'll be clean. And so that worked for a number of people. But that's a different issue than we think. You know, we, I guess the closest thing we can have to that is since COVID's come along, you know, is keeping social distance washing your hands, wearing masks and things like that. And, you know, some people yell at one another because they're not wearing masks. And some other people yell at people because they are. Uh, and that happens within the church. So uh, they had problems like that in the, the Roman church. And he said, and then there was a matter of holy days. And there was also an issue of alcohol. In the Roman church, you had some people that said no alcohol at all, and others said, oh, you know, take a little wine for the stomach. <laughs> but we have similar issues today. And the Apostle Paul said, you need to build one another up in love. Now, it was kind of interesting as things got heated and going along and things like that. Um, uh, the half-brother of Jesus, James, uh, called a church conference of all the churches throughout the, the land and said, come to Jerusalem, the first council of Jerusalem. He says, we're going to sort out some things. And he listened to everybody. And finally, at the end of that, they all agreed. It says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements, that you abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meat strangled, uh, of strangled animals, and abstain from sexual immorality, and that you will do well if you uh, do these things. One faction wanted you to follow all 613 regulations and rules of the, of the, the Mo Moses Code, starting with the Ten Commandments and their interpretations of how that went. And the Apostle uh, Paul brought the, the issue to the, the council at, at, at Jerusalem, and they said, no, the Gentiles... Uh, can follow them if they want, but they're not going to be bound to do every single rule that's there. 
So, why don't we conclude on this? We want to enjoy our freedom. We want to be free in Christ. We want to enjoy our freedom as Americans while keeping in mind that God wants us to build the church up, wants us to have peace, wants us to have joy, and that we are to temper our freedom with our care for one another. All right, that's my message.